Hi, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you and we thank you. We can truly say from the depth of our heart that there's nothing between you and us, Lord. So please cleanse us in the precious blood of Jesus and we come before you humbly. We ask you to speak to each one of us. We are needy people, Lord. So we come knocking at your door and we thank you that you have a word for each one of us because we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Um, it's so nice to see you all on the screen. And I'm so blessed to see and have fellowship with you. Uh, I've been reading uh, the parable of the sower. And I want to share something which the Lord has blessed me with. You know, when I read, read the parable of the sower and many words like that which Jesus spoke, I can take only a few teaspoons at a time. Like when we feed children, if we give their mouth full, they find it difficult and they choke and they can't swallow such a lot. But a little bit at a time, it tastes so good and so refreshing and so nourishing. So... I want to share uh, about that uh, parable of the sower. If we turn to Matthew uh, chapter 13, verses 3 to 16, we can read that, those, that parable. Um, that parable, Jesus says that a sower went to sow. We know that from our Sunday school days, we know that, that the sower went to sow and some seed fell on the uh, wayside and some on rocky and some on thorny ground and some on good ground. So the sower is God, uh, God's servant. Jesus himself later on in verse 37 in another parable Jesus says the son of God is the sower. So Jew, uh, God uses his, his workers he uses us as mothers to sow God's word into the hearts of our children he uses uh, books that we read, biographies and circumstances in our life. All those things he uses to sow the seed which he wants to plant into our heart. The seed is the word of God and uh, Jesus said, referred to it as the word of the kingdom of God. It was different from just reading the verses in the Bible. It's concerning the kingdom of God. Jesus said many times the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is near. So what is that kingdom of God? We know that in Romans um, 14, 17, it says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's not what we think. It's righteousness when our hearts are right with God, when Jesus has cleansed us from all our sin and we are in right relationship with the Lord. And more than that, to having the righteousness of Christ and righteous living, all that. And peace in our heart. When our sins are forgiven, we have peace in our heart. We have peace with other people. And joy in the Holy Spirit. When God does a work in our heart, we are filled with joy. A joy which the world cannot give. That's not that kind of happiness, but true lasting joy. And the field is the world. The um, the soil, the soil is our heart, where God, uh, where the Lord sows the seed of the kingdom of God into our heart, and it can be in a different, in uh, we can be in different levels, like uh, some of the seed which the sower sowed fell on the wayside. Now Jesus is the master sower. He is the ideal, he is the best sower. Though these days we sow with uh, people use tractors and all that. But in those days, they sowed the seed by hand. And Jesus, he didn't carelessly throw the seed of the kingdom of God wherever he happened to throw it. He had a plan and he was so good that he uh, sowed a few grains on the wayside. How good he is. Uh, we think, oh, wayside. What's the use of that? But he gives even people who are living in the wayside a chance 
to hear the gospel of the kingdom of god and the chance to develop and the chance to respond so uh, um, thinking about the wayside people living in the wayside first of all i can think of people who are out in the world you know they have no desire for earthly thing a uh, worldly uh, godly things they are only taken up with uh, earthly things some are even atheists they don't want to believe there is a god they don't want to believe in the bible they have no faith at all and there's a small category of people where it says uh, the seed went into their hearts but they didn't grow because the evil one came down and grabbed and took away that seed which was sown in the hearts so there was a little a bit of faith but it was not uh, there was a little bit of soil but not enough for the seed to grow what do, how i think of it like people who are so you know we were not very sure of spiritual things the, every time they hear something they are tossed this way or that way they are not serious about their spiritual life and in in luke if you read luke chapter 8 it says that uh, wayside group was a land where uh, people trampled under foot anybody walked that way they trampled that soil think of lot of uh, people in the world who are trampled and and nobody cares for them nobody takes the trouble to till that soil or take care of that soil it's just near the field but no one bothers about it indifferent to the gospel and and um, we were like that if we look back at our life many of us we were in that state not interested in the gospel not uh, even though we were grew up in christian homes and we heard the gospel from our childhood youthful things came into our life and we were more interested in the world than in following the lord we were indifferent we allowed things to happen and we thought oh later i like said the lord people or oh, here in life in the limbo that means just hanging out there not serious about spiritual things um i was like that to give you my testimony even though i grew up in a christian home and i'd heard uh, from my sunday school days about accepting jesus i was not um, taking uh, taking my spiritual life seriously till the lord in his mercy gave me a big jolt in my life uh, i had uh, i was poisoned by some uh, somebody who wanted to steal in our home uh, all of us were supposed to be killed by that poison but only i was affected god in his mercy saved me and i went into coma and uh, after a few days i recovered that brought me to start thinking if i had died in that state of coma the doctor said if i had taken a little bit of that poison i would have died then i thought if i had consumed more of that poison i would have gone to hell and god in his mercy spoke to me and brought me to his kingdom so i praise and thank god so sometimes god uses things like that in our lives to bring us into god's kingdom but not not just people who haven't accepted the lord sometimes some of us who have accepted the lord and found salvation and found him as our lord and savior can drift into that wayside level i know many of many people are like that and people call uh, jesus called them lukewarm christians if we turn to uh, revelation chapter 3 we can read about lukewarm christians they you can compare them with the people who are living on the wayside revelation chapter 3 it says uh, jesus said to the angel in the church of laodicea he said um, i know your deeds verse 15 i know your deeds that you are neither hot no cold nor hot i wish you were cold or hot so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold i will spit you out of my mouth and that was the warning jesus said he said he said because you say i am rich and i have become wealthy have need of nothing and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked 
So, how does one become a new uh, a lukewarm Christian? That's a warning to us. How can we become lukewarm? We can think, oh, everything is okay. Everything going smoothly for me now. I I have a good job. I'm rich. My husband is prospering. I have need of nothing. I'm comfortable. And sometimes we think I don't even need God because prayer and Bible reading has gone out into the periphery. We don't choose that, but it slowly shifted to the periphery. Our finances are good. And now there's no fear of COVID or anything like that. No fear of sickness. And we become uh, complacent. We rest like that and we think everything is okay. That is that's what God says we are have the we are prone to be in that lukewarm category, that wayside category. But God Jesus says you don't realize your true spiritual condition. He tells us instead of your riches, you are, we are actually poor, we are wretched, we are blind, we are naked. So sometimes with the God, the Lord has to shake us. There was a big shaking to bring us back out of that lukewarm state, you know, that state of lethargy and laziness. Where, where, if you think of the story of the pilgrim progress, when pilgrim passed by, that certain he found people just lazily sleeping and not at all uh, bothered that destruction was coming upon them. So the Lord uses sometimes some things to shake us and uh, come uh, uh, make us come out of that. Like you know, when uh, in hospitals, when the heart stops beating, uh, sometimes uh, in early stages they can give some medicine or something, and the heart revives. But sometimes they have to use those electrodes, you know, those deep fibrillators, to give us an electric shock. A shock and that will make our heart start working. Sometimes God brings something really drastic into our lives. Praise God. He doesn't let us go into that life of laziness, spiritual laziness and wants us to come back into his kingdom. Uh, so uh, when the Lord uh, Jesus told this church in Laodicea, your true condition is your uh, poor and wretched. He counsels us. What is the counsel he gives us? He says a few things. If you read in verse 19, he says, repent. Verse 19, last part. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So I can take that as the first stage. When we find we have come into that um, lukewarm stage, the Lord says, I'm giving you a chance to repent. Come back to me. Come back and confess where you have gone away and come back to me and drink of the fountain of life and that living water and I'll refresh you and give you back that life. So repent. Jesus, He says Jesus counsels us to do this. And then secondly, he says, buy gold. If you read in verse 18, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. That I want to think of that word refined, refined by fire. Yes, we have to pay a price. It's a, it doesn't come freely. We have to buy it. Pay something that something that's really costly to buy that process of being refined. The fire of testing. There's a price to be paid. Testing and you know how gold was put in the fire. In First Peter, we read First Peter one seven. Uh, we read this verse. We rejoice, though so for a little while you have been grieved by various trials. Trials test the genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes. Though it is tested by a fire, it might be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Christ is revealed. Now we need the fire of testing sometimes, that God has to put us through difficult circumstances, uh, circumstances, pressure, financial losses, 
like Joseph was put in the prison and tested and refined. Sometimes God allows refining and testing to her. So we should not be surprised. What's this happening to me? Why is God testing me? Why is God allowing this in my family? Why this sickness? Why this sudden accident? Why this financial loss? Why this death of this loved one? So many things God uses. That is a fire to refine us so that we can come out as gold. And it, we have to pay the price. It doesn't come freely. But And we, we must always remember that Jesus is holding the thermometer, the temperature. He will not allow us it to go too hot for us or destroy us. He holds the thermometer in his hand. And he holds also the knob of that fire. It doesn't go too hot or will be consumed and destroyed. He regulates it so that it's just enough for us to bear. Praise God. It doesn't, that fire doesn't go out of control. The Lord is in control of that. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, He knows. He'll give us a way to escape. He knows how much we can bear. And he won't test us beyond what we can bear. So we can hold on to those promises when we go through the fire of testing. That fire of testing is needed for all of us. None of us uh, free should be uh, would be free from that fire of testing. If we are not tested, we are unfit to enter into the kingdom of God. We need for different ones in different ways. Through some family situation, some parent uh, trouble from un uh, unchristian homes, some uh, people who are relatives who are not converted, who harm us and trouble us and mock us, some sickness in the family, financial loss, anything, loss of friends, loneliness, sick, uh, anything we can count it, all different trials which God allows in our life. But the Lord doesn't want us to be taken up looking at that trial. Don't look at the fire. The one who controls the fire is in charge of that. Our duty is say, Lord, what do you want me to learn out of this testing? Help me that this testing won't be in vain. I'll come out of it like gold, which is refined. And when the final stage will be when the uh, face of Jesus is seen in that gold, the Lord sees, ah, I can see my face in it. Then the testing is over. And the Lord tests us till the nature of Christ comes into us. Praise God. There's a purpose for that. That he tests the genuineness of our faith. In First Peter, he says, um, and in Revelation 3, 19, it says, I, um, uh, verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. It's because the Lord loves us that he's uh, disciplining us and reproving us and testing us and rebuking us. And we have to just respond to him. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. He's given us, he, the door, the um, knob of that door is on our side. It's up to us. He won't open the door and crash in and get into our uh, privacy of our heart. We have to open the door and say, Lord, yes, I accept the trusting which you are allowing in, allowing in my life, the discipline, the loss, the sickness. I accept it, Lord, and please come in and fellowship with me. Speak to me from your word and help me to have fellowship with you and get to know you more and more in my life. Then, so that is the uh, first is repent and second is uh, buy that gold, accept the discipline uh, of um, testing which God allows in our life so that we won't become a lukewarm Christian. Or if we are a lukewarm Christian, we can come out of that state and be close and be on fire for the Lord. The third is says, clothe yourself with white garments to cover your nakedness. That also, you read that um, in verse 18. White garments so that you may clothe yourself, that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. So the Lord wants to clothe us. It, we can get it from him only. Um, that reminds me of, first of all, the 
the free gift of salvation. If you read in Isaiah 61 verse 10, it says, Isaiah 61 verse 10, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. That's a verse to remind ourselves. We will accept the gift of salvation when we come to the Lord and say, Lord, I accept that salvation because you have covered my nakedness. My, my true self is so wretched and so rotten. I don't want people to see what a wretched person I am. But you cover me with the gar garment of salvation. So my, my wretchedness is not seen. So I will exult. I will rejoice. I will praise you, Lord, for that gift of salvation. Dear sisters, we can never be um, stop thanking God. Be grateful enough for the gift of salvation the Lord has given us. Then another, that salvation is free. But there's another thing which we have to do. That is our own cleansing. We have to, in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 31, it says, we have to cleanse ourselves. It says, if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged by, our, by, the, by the Lord when he returns. So the daily cleansing we have to do to keep ourselves clean, our garments clean, so it's white. Our garment means our outward testimony is seen and um, people don't see that, that there is failure in our life by our daily judging of ourselves. That we learn uh, only in the new covenant. Many times, many people I have heard say, once you're born again, that's enough. You don't have to worry. You've got your free ticket to heaven. No, there's a work for us after we have come to know the Lord. There's a work for us to do to judge ourselves, purify ourselves. It says we have to purify ourselves just as He is pure. Um, uh, if you read in 1 John 3 2, this verse is if we have the hope of the second coming of Jesus, we will be purifying ourselves just as He is pure. If we have the hope when Jesus comes, we will be like Him then we'll keep on cleansing ourselves. And one day when we see him, we will be like him. Praise God for that wonderful hope that we have. The hope that Jesus is coming and the hope that Jesus will be like him. But what do we do in the meantime? We have to cleanse ourselves, purify ourselves. If we have that hope, we will be purifying ourselves so that we'll be ready to meet him. Then there are, there's a... Um, Another verse in Revelation 16, which says, uh, Revelation 16, verse uh, 15 says, Stay awake so that you won't be found naked. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. So we have to keep make sure that our garments are clear, clean, outward testimony is good, and there's nothing, as we sang today, there's nothing between my Lord and uh, my Savior and me. Always a spirit of uh, attitude of cleansing. Just like our eyes, we know how eyes throughout the day, the tears keep on cleaning our eyesight so that we, we, our eyesight is good. We are not spiritually blind. I'll talk about it in the next sentence, the next uh, uh, time. But uh, there's an, a beautiful verse which I want to share, and that is in Revelation 19, verse 8. That is such a beautiful verse that I always think of it. The Revelation 19, verse 8, it says, At the, um, it talks about the marriage of the marriage feast of the Lamb when Jesus comes and takes us into his kingdom and there's going to be a big celebration and we, the all of us who are born again and we, the bride of Christ we are, when we um, come into the marriage of the Lamb, it says let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him that is to Jesus for 
the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen bright and clean for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints and i thought i was so blessed by this verse it says that we, uh, i realized that we have a part to do to prepare our wedding garment can you imagine a, a bride getting ready for her wedding and she is making her own wedding dress stitch by stitch she is stitching her wedding dress and uh, like many, many many times i have seen uh, the lady sitting and crocheting a blanket or a sweater or something whenever they have a free time they are doing that knitting stitch by stitch stitch by stitch till that whole garment is complete so we who are ready and waiting to be the bride of christ we have that wonderful privilege of making our wedding dress ready stitch by stitch by the righteous acts of the saints our good life our testimony the good deeds that we do those are the stitches that are going to go into our wedding dress is first of all the lord gives us that garment of salvation we are clothed with that but the uh, another side of it is the beautiful wedding garment that we are preparing while on earth we can't suddenly go to heaven and think that there's going to be a wedding dress placed on us while on earth we are preparing our wedding garment by the righteous deed that we do the good deeds that we do the sacrifices that we do the hidden uh, self denials the things that we do in our private life which only jesus can see the uh, whatever people may say to us or about us they may curse us hate us revile us but we keep quiet this is another stitch coming into our wood, into our wedding dress when we are tempted to get angry and flare up and we don't do that another stitch when we are tempted to eat and eat and we think no this is not the time i can do without this or when we are tempted to overspend and we say no i want i can do without this that's another stitch going into our wedding garment think of all the stitches that we can put into our wedding garment every day of our lives till the lord returns we can get a chance to prepare our wedding garment so it's not a time when we can just relax and sit dear sisters we each one we can take the opportunity in our homes dealing with our children dealing with our families in our time of sickness in our times of distress or want a persecution whatever happens in our times of loneliness each is an opportunity to make a stitch into our wedding dress and how glorious that wedding dress is going to be with all these hidden things which no one has seen all the beautiful embroidery that has gone into it we are prepared to meet our bridegroom praise god for that wonderful calling he has given so we also it remind me of the uh, parable of the wise virgins where jesus said about the virgins five were wise and five were foolish the wise virgins had oil in their lamps they were collecting oil how does oil come by the crushing crushing of some seed crushing of the peanut you get peanut oil crushing of oil olives you get olive oil by the crushing process oil is collected and drop by drop we are collecting that oil to prepare us for to meet our bridegroom so praise god the lord has given us so many um, uh, beautiful uh, chan uh, explanations and uh, thoughts to keep us going encouraging us be faithful be be faithful in the little things not in the big things where everybody can see but in the daily things of life in our thought life what we think of others whether we are having angry thoughts or unmerciful thoughts about others all those are chances where we can collect a little oil or we can put a little stitch into our wedding dress praise god for that wonderful so when we face different trials uh big trials sicknesses our uh, challenges in our home challenges in the church challenges with our children we think lord don't let me waste this 
chances I get to make put another stitch in in my wedding garment, so I won't be ashamed. I won't be naked when you come, and others don't see my wretched condition, but you'll see me clothed in that beautiful garment. There's one garment which the Lord gives us, and there's another garment which we can do. And the Lord says, "Oh, my bride, how beautiful you are with this wedding garment which you have done secretly, away from the eyes of people. You have done it. You've been alone, but you were faithful to me. It was so wonderful when our bridegroom meets us with that joy and love. We can see that love in his eyes. Then um, another way we can." Uh, the lord tells us in revelation 3 is um by i salve for your eyes he says you uh, it says you are blind and wretched and poor so blindness what do we do when we are for our blindness uh in that backslidden state or in that wayside state or in that lukewarm state uh what do we do about our blindness the lord will give us that we can get it only from him to open our eyes uh, how do we get that spiritual blindness even after we born again we are born again we can get blind spiritually we know that like you know older people as we grow older we get a thing called cataract it grows in eyes and we stop uh, we can't see things clearly and we need help to get that taken care of so jesus says has given us some solution for that eye problem that blindness that we get we don't realize we are blind but we are really the lord says in my eyes you are blind how do we get blind and first john chapter 2 verse 11 says when we hate others when we hate somebody then we are in spiritual blindness first john 2 11 says hating uh, when you hate um the one who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes so we should be so there vigilant and careful that we don't allow hatred towards anybody in our heart others may not see but spiritually if we allow hatred to come into our heart then we are getting into that blind state somebody may have done some harm to us maybe in our childhood maybe later on maybe even now yesterday somebody may have done some harm to us deliberately done some harm or said some rude word or was mean to us life is full of such things we'll never until our dying day there'll be people who will harm us who oppose jesus said uh, if they hated me they'll hate you in the world you will have tribulation but be of good cheer good cheer i have overcome the world jesus told us there will be but if we allow that hatred to enter into our heart and we dwell in it and we allow that hatred to grow it's like a little bit of yeast a little bit of poison which gets into our heart it becomes so bad that our whole being gets polluted with that uh that poison that bad stuff that hatred and the lord says if you allow that hatred to come then you will get blind so we come to the lord and say lord i am beginning to hate this person why did he say like that why did she do like that why did she behave like that to me why did she not show i uh, come and help me when i was in need so many wise but the lord says take it away lord please don't let me dwell on that thought don't let me think on that of that hateful thing even for a second that's the meaning of judging ourselves say lord take it away i don't want it to stay in my heart at all you know it may come again after a few minutes that temptation may come to hate that person again we say lord again that hateful thought is coming please take it away i don't want to hate it and slowly slowly we re- reject it and reject it then that hatred is taken away and and we can say lord instead of hatred give me love in my heart for that person i have experienced that so many times i i would think like normally i would have been tempted to hate a person who did so much harm to me or to my family but 
uh, thank God to the glory of God, I can say, such a work Jesus can do in our heart that he changes that hatred and puts love in our heart for that person. Praise God for such a wonderful gospel. No, nobody can do that for us. Nowhere can, no medicine can do that. Uh, no magic or anything. It's only the Lord who can change hatred into love. And I can, I can testify so many, many instances when I would have been tempted to hate. The Lord took away that hatred and put love in his heart, in my heart for that person. So if we hate others, then we are going on the road of that spiritual blindness. Then and I just put a few points. I think you can think of so many others uh, areas by which we can become blind. I thought of uh, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. It says, if we love this world, then we become blind. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. It says, love of this world. The God of this world has blinded our eyes. That's that verse. The God of this world. If we start going after worldly things, worldly pleasures, comfort of this world, and the uh, satisfaction that comes from worldly things, uh, purchasing things, and going into a shopping spree and getting whatever we like, then all those love, uh, love of worldly things can blind our eyes and say, Lord, I don't want to allow that to come into my life. I want to die to that and say, Lord, take away the desire for these worldly things, loving of this, loving this world, and let me love you, replace with love for you. Um, then in 1 Peter 1 9, it says, if we forget our former purification, then we become blind. 1 Peter 1 9. Anytime we forget, the pit from which the Lord has picked us up. We forget that we were such wretched, rotten sinners and the Lord in his mercy picked us out. None in our family has known the Lord, no Lord's love as we have. And the Lord in his mercy picked us up and gave us the gift of salvation and helped, brought us into his kingdom. If we forget that, and we look down on others and we say, huh, I am saved. She's not yet saved. I'm in God's kingdom. She's still in the world. She's still in the traditional church. She's still doing her chanting and her um, all that former worship. And we look down on anybody and we forget our former purification. Then we are um, we are getting into that category of becoming blind becoming and going into that lukewarm stage and that wayside stage. You know that song which we sang today, Oh Love That Will Not Let Me Go, that was written by a blind man, George Matheson. He became blind and he had so much suffering in his heart and he wrote that beautiful song of God's love which will not let, did not let him go and the cross which lifted up his head. That song always speaks to me and said how how much this blind man came to know the love of God and rest, found rest in Jesus so he could write such a beautiful song which blesses us. In Ephesians 1.18, Paul praised this prayer. If you turn to Ephesians 1.18, Paul says, He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart be enlightened to know what is the hope with which he has called us. So we want the Lord to open our eyes to see the hope to which he has called us. The hope, that hope that we'll be with him, the hope that we'll be like him, the hope that we can be changed from one degree of glory to another. That hope, the Lord uh, Paul prays that our eyes will be open to see that hope. And secondly, eyes, eyes will be open to see the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Think of that. The glorious in his glorious inheritance. That means God has an inheritance 
because he saved us. It's not like we became his and we got an inheritance. But it's so wonderful because God brought us into his kingdom. He has become rich. What a wonderful thing that Almighty God, owner of this whole earth and this whole, whole universe, he has become rich. He has got an inheritance because of us. Because we came into his kingdom, he has got an inheritance. It's like <laughs> the backwards. Instead of us being getting the inheritance, he has got an inheritance because of uh, us. What I can see how um, the humility, the true divine humility God has to think that we wretched sinners are so valuable to him. We are an inheritance to him. I can never get over that thought. Lord, because of me, you have become rich. It's the other way around, Lord. Because of you, I have become rich. But you, so gracious, you are saying that you have become rich because of me. A wretched sinner, you have become rich. I praise you. And Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be opened to see the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his great, great might when he raised Jesus from the dead. That mighty power, that resurrection power is ours. Paul says, I want your eyes to be opened, those blind eyes to be opened to see resurrection power. There's such a mighty power for us, dear sisters. That just a, not a little bit to just lift a little trial of us. The mighty power, the resurrection power which raised Jesus from the dead, a dead person coming back to life. That resurrection power the Lord has, wants to give us. And Paul says, I want your eyes to be opened to see that. That power is available for us. That power to, not to do great things, but the power to have that life of victory in us. Not to show off that, oh, I can do this miracle, I can do that, and my prayer made this person all right and my prayer changed this whole thing and we can testify so many things to uh, glorify our name but the Lord has says the Lord wants us to have that mighty power so that our dead we who are dead in sin can be resurrected and can have the life of Jesus flowing through us the beauty of Jesus the patience of Jesus the long suffering of Jesus the, all the virtues in the, uh, of which the Lord wants to give us, that goodness, when it can be good to everybody, even those who hate us. He wants us. And how do we get that power? He says, I am giving you that almighty power. That resurrection power is yours. Let's have faith in that. Let's say, Lord, it's not in my strength that I am going to overcome. Your power, your almighty resurrection power is available to me. So I can faith. Jesus, I can have faith. Jesus said, if you have faith as much as a mountain, uh, as much as a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. Yes, our self-life and our sinful nature is like a big mountain. But faith as much as a mustard seed is so big. It's so big that resurrection power is given to us and we can move that that uh, defeat defeated life of us and we can have a life of victory. Let's have faith for that. Lord, I'm such a melancholic person. I'm easily getting discouraged. I'm easily getting depressed. I'm so lonely. I'm so sick. All those things the Lord can take away because of his resurrection power. Praise God. And it's not that God uh, compels us. In the Old Testament, um, there were laws. You shall do this. You should do that. You shouldn't do that. But in the New Covenant, Jesus just gently knocks at the door. Says, "If you want, if you open the door, I'll come with you, and I'll change. I'll come in and change your life." He says, um, "He who has ears to hear, let him hear." It's not that loud. He speaks, screams at us. If you want to hear, that's why in the in the in this parable, Matthew thirteen, he says, um, uh, "Jesus told the disciples." 
the blessed are, are your uh, Matthew 13 verse 16 blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear for truly I say I say to you many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it and he says earlier uh, about these people they will keep on hearing but they will not understand the heart of these people have become dull and they have closed their ears they 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 would see with their eyes but they they don't perceive the lord wants to open our eyes and open our ears to hear what the lord wants pray so praise and thank the lord he doesn't want us to remain in a lukewarm state or in that category of the wayside people you know once we were born again and we drift back into that wayside category where the seed sown in our heart gets taken away by the evil one no the lord wants even for such a person god has some hope so so a time is up but i just want to uh, summarize what i have said the lessons that we can learn from this parable of the sower especially the section about the seed which is sown in the wayside we have to repent we have to judge ourselves to come back we have to purify ourselves we yeah. and we uh, and don't forget the righteous deeds of the saints our christ our life has to be uh, righteous and we have to do our part to be ready and don't forget our former purification don't allow the world the hay, and uh, things of this world to choke that seed don't allow set, uh, hatred to come into our life and you know one more thing i want to say many of our loved ones sometimes maybe our children are living in that wayside area they are getting trampled under foot as it says in luke 8 many love of our loved ones are still in that wayside and god in his graciousness pulled us out but don't turn our back on such children or such loved ones don't don't take turn our back on them pray for them pray for them give them uh, help them when they are stuck there love them do whatever we can to help them to jump over that not sit on that fence but jump across and come into the field where there's a good soil where the uh, truths of the kingdom of god can take root and pay the price pay the price uh, whether they are suffering uh, accept the refining which the lord gives in our life every time uh, the lord puts us through the fire we should not say lord i want to jump out of this fire say lord you as long as you want let this fire burn and dry take away all the dross from my life my life till i can reflect the image of jesus in my life and be ready for your coming and not be ashamed not shrink back when you come be ready for your coming lord so may the lord help each one of us and help our, us to you use us to bring our loved ones also out of that trampled area that wayside area pray for them and do all that we can because the time is short jesus coming is so near help us to uh, we must be ready we must make our loved ones ready our children ready for his coming amen shall we just close in prayer our heavenly father we thank you for the wonderful gospel and wonderful news you have to have given us lord the secrets of the kingdom of god lord you opened that kingdom to us lord where we can have righteousness and peace and joy in the holy spirit you've been so good to us lord to give us this kingdom uh, a chance to enter into that kingdom help us lord not to waste a single moment not to waste a single day of our life but be ready for your coming we ask this in jesus precious name amen uh, i hear thy welcome voice that calls me lord to thee for cleansing in thy precious blood that flowed on calvary i am coming lord coming now to thee wash me cleanse me in the blood that flowed on calvary tis jesus calls me on to perfect faith and love 
to feel perfect hope and peace and trust for earth and heaven above. All hail atoning blood, all hail redeeming grace, all hail the gift of Christ, our Lord, our strength and righteousness. I am coming, Lord.